And what I'm continuing on right now is foundational teaching. Why can I, all oh, this scribble board, oh my gosh. But it's funny because when they put this board up here, I hadn't used it in a while, that we had this we talked about, then, then we talked about this, and then last week we talked about this. And actually, I can leave this same thing up here. Even though it's a different message, but it's still, we're building is what we're doing. You d when you leave first grade and go to second grade, you left it, but you didn't leave what you learned behind. This is how God does. When you go from middle school to high school, okay, I, I forgot all that. No, if you forget it all, you're going to be in trouble. God is building. I don't care what experiences you've had in life through a different church, through a different minister, uh, uh, through a different marriage, through a different heartbreak. I'm telling you, if you will let God, he'll take every one of those things and there'll be building blocks that you have learned, building blocks that's been placed in some, some things that you know, which are stones. There's some things you believe, but then there's some things you know. You believe until you know. See, you can believe God is a healer, but until God heals you, you don't know it. You believe it by faith. But when it happens, you go, no, I know God's a healer. I know God can t bring somebody through a divorce. I know God can bring somebody through the death of a child. I know God, because you've been through that thing, you know, and they're like stones in you. And everything that's been happening in you, he said, I'll make you lively stones, living stones. So we're building on something. We're building foundational things. I talked last week about the three levels of the word, and I want to say that you can go on YouTube right now. I don't know if all of our messages, all the messages are up. Also, you can go back to our old website. Our new one is still under construction. We reverted back to the old one for a while, so the messages are all up. You can go back and watch the messages, but also, that's on ChristianGatheringChurch.com, but also, we are also, all of our messages are on YouTube also. So you can go on there, and there, those are on there. Our um, anniversary videos on there. Our Father's Day, if you missed it, Mother's Day, if you want to see your face on there. Uh, those are also on YouTube. So go to Christian Gathering YouTube channel, and you can see that. Oh, we're getting uppity in the world now. Woo! Who knows? We might be on a, not Snapchat. <laughs> You're showing your age, John. He's so young. He thinks young. Uh, we, I think we're on Instagram and all kind of stuff now. Who knows? But anyway, we're talking about three levels. That's got erased a little bit. Three levels of God's word. And we've been talking about three levels of a lot of things. We talked about the three parts of the, the tabernacle of God. Why do I still go back to the tabernacle? What is the tabernacle? I need to review a little bit. It is, but his presence resides there. But what was the significance of even having this tabernacle? It was a way and showed him he was going to come down. Yes, it, that's part of it. So what happened, what was this thing? Moses was brought up, and I'm going to be talking a little bit about Moses. Moses went up into the mountain, and he was there, and the Lord, the glory of God came upon him. Let me just go ahead and read that. Exodus 33, 17 through 23. The Lord said to Moses, I will do this thing also that thou hast spoken. Oh, I'm gonna, For thou hast found grace in my sight, and I know thee by name. Do you know if you're here today, it's because you have found grace in his sight, and he knows you by name? Zoe, we're so glad you're back. And he does know you by name. Each one of you, he knows you. He told Moses, he said, I'm going to do what I said I would do. He said, and Moses said to him, I beseech thee, Lord, show me your glory. And God said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the Lord, the name of the Lord before thee. But he said, Thou cannot see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me, and thou shalt stand upon a rock, and when it shall come to pass, while my glory passes by, I will put thee in the cliff of the rock, and I will cover thee with my hand while I pass by. And I will take away, then I'll take away my hand, and thou shalt see my back parts, but my face thou shalt not see. He said, Nobody's going to look upon the face of God and live. Do y'all know that? Do y'all know the Bible says that no man has seen God at any time? Over and over, he said, God is invisible. The God of the universe is invisible, and no man has seen him. Well, people would get confused going, wait a minute. He said he showed him his back parts. 
So God has a back. Well, you know what the word back part means? What is behind? Like to the west. That's what, that's what it looks up in the, in the Greek, or actually the Hebrew. You shall see what is behind. Now, this is where we believe, theologians believe, that God showed Moses all what he had done in the past. This is when Moses wrote Genesis. He believed John, Genesis. Who, who, who was there to record that God said, let there be light? How, did, how does anybody know he said that? How do we know? Who was they? Is Moses. This is when it happened. He sh- went and showed him all the past, all the hind parts, all that was before. And Moses was able to record these things that we have in the written word right here. Yes, the Spirit of God moved upon him and he wrote down. Did, have y'all heard that before? I, I, you know, it took me some learning. I'm like, now, how, who did know? Who was there with him in the garden? How did, who's seen him take Eve out of this? Well, this is where people believe that it happened because he showed him his, uh, the, the back parts. But he says, my face shall not be seen. Now, we know that when Moses came down from this mountain, he had several things. First of all, one time he came, he had the Ten Commandments. He also uh, came down. He, he, the glory of God was so strong upon his face because he had been in the presence of God. He said the glory was on him that he had to put a veil over his face. Not only people couldn't even see, you couldn't see God and live because he's so awesome, flesh couldn't handle it. But not only that, people couldn't even stand to be in the presence. His glory, God's glory, because he had been there, God's glory was now reflecting off of Moses in such a powerful way that he had to cover his face. Read it for yourself. So uh, we're getting into this, this third one here, but he also came down, let's go back to the table, with a design or a, the, um, the pattern. Thank you, John. God said, I'm going to make a place, like you said, that I can come and dwell with men. God is a spirit. He's all over. He's omnipresent. He fills all space and time. But he said, I'm going to make myself like condensed is what I call glory. Glory, the word glory means weight. It's the heaviness. It's like, it's like when it gets so thick in here that you can feel it. God isn't here right now. But I'm going to tell you something. When you start manifest, when you start glory, giving him glory, 300 and something times the word glory is like to give glory, to glorify. All those words mean to give something to God, to give him glory. Oh, my soul, magnify and gl- give God glory. Give God glory. How do we give God glory? We give him the credit. We're, we're sitting up. We know who you are. We give you the weight. You get the credit. You are the weighty one in this, this situation. So when I say, no, I can't take the credit for that, I give God the glory, which is what Brother Lauren said. He goes, I'm not worthy of all these things you're saying. Jesus gets all the glory. In fact, I'm going to lay here beside you just show you I am nothing but flesh. And that is the only kind of person God really can show his glory. Because if you start thinking you're something, God's like, well, let, you can have it then. Just do it. But there comes some point you relinquish this thing, and that's when God is going to be able to get the glory, and you know you didn't do it. So let me get back to this tabernacle. He come down with a pattern. He says, I want you to build this exactly the way I said it. I wasn't going to go into this, so I don't have all the scriptures, but we can find them and give you the details. But this tabernacle was an, Im- it was an image, a pattern of what Moses seen in the heavenlies. He said, I'm going to show you my glory. I'm going to show you what's happening up here. I'm going to show you that there's a mercy seat up here, and there's angels around it crying one to another, holy, holy is the lamb. That was going to be the mercy seat. That's where God sat upon his throne, and the, and, and the earth is his footstool. He's seen this. Moses seen in the, in the spiritual. He said, I want you now to see how this is arranged. There's an outer court. There's an inner court. And there's a holies of holies. And all these things, he said, I want you to make a pattern. He told him exactly how to do it, what furniture to put in it, what to make. Oh, wow, this, this is something we could preach for years on. But every bit of this was so important because this was going to be a model and a pattern of a spiritual kingdom that was going to come. That's why I talk about it. That's why everything I'm talking about living word, I'm talking glory, honor, and power, if I'm talking about peace and joy and righteousness and the Holy Ghost, 
when I'm teaching you physical principles, I'm teaching you uh, not just some concept, I'm teaching you applicable principles, aren't I? I'm talking to you how to love people, how to act. Well, all of that can go right back to this. This was a physical representation of what is in heaven. It was going to be the kingdom. How did you enter? There's a door right here. What did Jesus say? I am the door. Okay, we can take it. There was this, this door was actually a piece of the, uh, it was a mighty door. It was not any door. It was carved. It was elaborate. It was told, well, it, it was told exactly how to do each part of this. It was very significant. Jesus was going to be the door, right? The first thing you walked in the door, there was a, an altar. And this was a bloody altar. This is the place where you came in. Before you could go any further, you had to offer some kind of sacrifice for your sins. That priest would go in there and they would slaughter a, a turtle dove or a, a whatever. There was all kind of a, a, a bullock, a goat, a lamb. But these were the things. This was the outer court. This was the first thing you've seen here was this altar. We know this is, and also everything in here was made of, of brass. And that's significant. Here's, a, here's this. The first thing you did was stop right here. Then this was the, I, I, this is the um, place where you washed, the lava where you washed. What this represented was death. Jesus came here and he died, right? The first next thing he did, he was buried. What does the Bible say how we're buried? We're buried with him in baptism. This is where you give your life to God. This is where you say, I'm yours. I die. Come and be my Lord. Who was it said today? There was a word said to call him Lord from the Morans. Don't forget to call him Lord. That means he's boss, he's ruler. You are Lord. See, some people want, they want to come to Jesus and just want a Savior, save me from my sins. But they're not interested in being Lord. If you really, when you get really saved, I'm telling you what, you die to you and you say, you're my, I give you me. Joyce Myers calls it signing over the deed to the house. <laughs> you say, okay, this is your house. I give myself to you. I give myself away so you can use me. Right here, you die with Christ. Thank God. We don't really have to be crucified. I don't have to because I'm in Christ. He was crucified. The next step was the lava. That's the washing. That's the burial. That now I can come out a new person and I can go to the next level. Death, burial, resurrection. Come out of this water. Now I go into this part. My life starts another. Now I'm learning. I'm living a new life. I just went through a different section of my life. A new, some of y'all just came through it. And isn't it glorious? When you're a new baby, I love these new babies. I love them when they get on fire for God and they really get that salvation experience. I, the, the sister Angela right here, I tell you what, she, every, night at, every Monday night at prayer meeting, she does not come alone. She brings somebody from her workplace every week. She's so excited about Jesus. She's not dragging people to church. She's not telling people, you're going to go to hell if you don't come to church. No, she's just glowing with the glory of God out there at that casino. The darker the place, the brighter the light. And all these people just been streaming our house on Monday nights. Streaming tears. Streaming. I'll tell you what, this is so exciting when you get here. But when you really get this, you will go right here. And the first thing you ran into was a candlesticks. There was, I had oil in them. The oil represents the anointing, the light on the candlesticks. This is where you start walking in the light of the Lord. His word becomes a light into your path. And so right here, over here was the show bread. It had the loaves of bread. What is the bread? It's the word of God. Now you start eating different things. Now you're eating of the bread. You have the light. And then right here was an altar, another altar, another altar. This was the altar of incense. This is the place where you came and they offered an offer of incense. And what, you know, what is incense before the Lord? The Bible said the prayers, the worship of the saints came what? Before the Lord as a sweet-smelling savor, an incense. This is where you go hear what happened this morning in service. Brother Michael said, just don't even look at the words. Close your eyes. Go a little further. Just give yourself now another time. This is after I've already been saved, but now I've got to die again. Now I just fall out and worship and say, I don't want my head. Somebody said this morning, I need to get out of my head. And I said it last week, and it's written on my paper here. Get out of my head and get more into his head. That's what happens right here because he is the head. This is the feet. You come in and you grow up into the headship of God. This is also a picture of the Lord. 
oh, I can't even, this is so amazing. I love this. It's a pattern. This is our life right now. This is what people do. They get saved and they get here. And this is a perfect picture of the church. And this is what we do in church. And this is great. You've got to have this, this to get to this. There's no knocking the written word, the spoken word, because right here is the spoken word. This is where you get the light and the bread. This is where you worship God. This is having church. And most of us live right here after we're Christians. Now, some people just say back here, I just want to get saved. That's all I want. That's all I want. I just don't want to, I just don't want to go to hell one day. That's all they're worried about is, let me tell you something. When you really get this, you're going to want to go on to this. They can't even hardly keep you from church. You'll be looking like me. I went around and around and looked and looked and looked. I, just, I was like, you know what? Look, God, I'm going to, you've got to give this to me. I sought God, and look what he did. This is right here. It's having church. I'm not talking about in the building, per se. This is where you have the light. This is how you have the bread. And some people are really happy being just here. Let's worship. Let's have some word. Let's have some light. God's helping me. And this is a glorious thing. And really, this is where the spoken word comes into effect. Last week, I talked about the living word, but really, I talked more about this section. Because this section, this was, this was the brass this is the brass and gold. And brass represents flesh. Wood and brass represents flesh. This is a, a place where you go. It's, the Lord said, some of you need to see this. It's a place where Jesus went. This is a lonely place. This is a place where you, just like Christ, had to be obedient unto the cross, he said. He went alone. He went alone through that cross. He went alone through that grave. But he came up victorious. This is a personal decision that you have to make to be saved. Y'all know that. It doesn't depend on mom and daddy, these young people. It doesn't depend on husband and wife. At some point, you've got to say, I give you the deed to my house. I'm yours. You are mine. We're going to go on this journey together. But then as soon as you get here, what happens? Then this is God and man. This is the brass and the wood, and the bra- it was overlaid with gold. This is where you and God are in connection. This is the Holy Ghost in man walking around, and I'm listening, and it's me and him together. This is where I am learning how to live my life. We talked about last week, does a man have a uh, light and put it under a bushel? Does a man have a light and go hide under a bed? And we talked about some of the ways that we put ourselves under a bushel basket. We talked about what is your bushel, what is your basket, what is the bed you're hiding under, is it fear, is it shame, is it condemnation? But see, this is right here, it's man and God working together. Do y'all see this? Everything in here was the, the wood or brass overladen with gold. This is where we are walking with God together, right here. This is the life I'm living every day at work. One minute they might see me and one minute they might see God. But this is where I'm striving to be the spoken word. And spoken word here is not just what I'm speaking with my mouth. It's the life I'm living. It's not just the, what I'm doing with my mouth. It's the life I'm living. Now let me just refer to that. It's very important the life we live. But I still really haven't even got to this part yet. This is very important because what is the old saying? The only Bible some people read is us, right? They see us. Remember what I said? People don't, people don't really care how much you know until they know how much you care. They look at you, do you care about me? There's a sign out here in our foyer that said people may forget what you say, but they'll never forget how you made them feel. See, what we do in the flesh is very important as we walk our life with us and God because people are seeing this. We are being the spoken word right here. I'm saying it and I'm living it. It is a spoken word, and it's important because as we read in 1 Corinthians, he said, with many of them God was not well pleased for they were overthrown in the wilderness because of why? Their idolatry, their fornication, and their murmuring. You mean he just put fornication and murmuring in the same line? Some people are judging people that are fornicating. They're murmuring about the fornicators. Oh, we have all these levels of sin in our mind. They were overthrown in the wilderness, not only because they worshipped idols and not because they had sexual immorality, but they were murmuring. 
complaining about God, complaining about the manna, complaining about one another. He said, because of these things, God was not pleased and they were overthrown in the wilderness. But now these things were for our examples to the intent that we should not lust or desire evil things as they did. For now these things happen unto them for our examples. They're written for our ammunition. Therefore let he, him that stand, thinketh he stand take heed lest he fall. So these things are very important. If we're out here, we continue in sin and we continue in activities. Murmuring to me is one of the worst of them. Worst. Worstest, probably what Brother Shane would say. If you're at work and you're murmuring around, you're talking about people, and especially if you're murmuring about somebody, yeah, I can't believe they're over there shacked up. Well, let me tell you something. You just put yourself in the same bar barrel with them, and the world, it's not a good example. It's not pleasing to God, he said. He said, so don't, when you're thinking you're standing, because you're thinking you're all that, take heed lest you fall. And so that's an example that we learned out of this Egypt wilderness promised land experience. They got stuck right here in the wilderness. They got stuck right here having church. They got stuck because they did not even know. They got their sights off that there was a, a, a only they got murmuring because they forgot to, that there was another place they were going. See, churches get stuck right here, and they think this is all that is. And if you stay on the wilderness long enough, you'll do just what they did. If you don't go a little further over here, if it's just about what we do in church, what we do and how to live right and all those good things that we need to do so we don't destroy our life and destroy our spoken word that we're speaking in our life, it's very important. But why do people get stuck here in church for 40 years, going around a circle, going around a circle, when there really is a promised land over here, which is the holies of holies, where God sits on the throne, and this is no more wood or brass. It's all gold. Now, what I'm trying to get you to today is there is a higher level than just what as I've experienced or now what me and God is experiencing and what I'm saying and doing in this world. There is a place where this is a place of glory. This is God. This is the time that you can't even get there until you give up your works. Oh, my goodness. It, how many of y'all told me I finally gave up figuring out how to change that man or change that woman or change that child? or change that boss, or change my co-worker, and I just gave it to God. You know what you did? You died right here. Another altar, altars were a place of death. It's where now I'm giving up my prayers. I'll just say, um, the word worship, remember what the word worship means? To lay prostate before the Lord, to bow. That's what Brother Lawrence did while here. This is a place of worship where you just give up everything. Once again... I did it here when I got saved, but once again, how many of y'all have it again and again and again I have to die? Once again, I get to that place. I can't make this marriage work. I can't heal myself. I can't do it. Me and you, it's not enough. I've done everything I know. It's up to you. And when I die right here, I get to this place, and all of a sudden the Lord changes them, and you start saying, why didn't I do this a long time ago? Why did I think God needed my big mouth to change that person? He was like, as long as it's you, okay, I'm going to help you. I'm going to bless you. But at some point, you're going to go through the next altar. You're going to kill yourself again and say, I cut my head off. I don't want my brain. I want the brain of God. I lose my mind. Revelations, John seen, he said, I seen the souls of them that were beheaded, the souls under the altar that were beheaded for God. He didn't say, I've seen the heads of the people beheaded. Somebody needs to think about that. You know what soul means? In, in real, in psyche. It's the psyche. I've seen the souls. I've seen the mind. I've seen them when they lost their mind. They said, Whoosh, I ain't figuring this out. Here I am. Half a prisoner. I am going to give my mind to you. I no, more, no longer want to pray my will, but yours be done. Quit telling God, well, I, I need you to do this. I need you to do that. No. I just worship you. I now want your head to be my head. I want the glory of God to reside on me because I don't know what to say. I don't know how to fix this. I want the glory of God to be upon me.
I talked about last week to be an epistle of Christ, a letter, physical seeing Christ. But really, I end up talking a lot about what we do to let people see Christ. The doing is in this dimension. This is the being. It's more than what I do. It's more than not sinning or saying the right things. It's just who I am. It's a supernatural place where God does things that I'm not even aware of just simply because I've been in his presence. Let me, let me read this right here. In 2 Corinthians, I, I started this last week, 3. You are our epistles, a letter written, engraved in our hearts, known and read of men. For as much as you are manifestly declared to be an epistle of Christ, ministered by us, not written with ink, but by the Spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but tables of the heart. This word right here, manifestly declared, took me somewhere further than you're just an epistle. You're more than just what people see. He says you have been manifestly declared. What does it mean to manifest? To reveal, to become, I manifest this. He said you have been manifestly declared. Something about you declares who you are. He didn't say you do it. You have been manifestly declared that you're a letter from God, that you are a word from God. You are who you are. You have been declared, not by you, not what you're saying, but by God has manifest himself somehow on you. He said it's been written in not ink, but by the Spirit of living God, not on tablets of stone, but by the in your heart. There's something that happens when you get to this place with God. You don't even know it. I didn't realize it, that I was more than what I did. I knew what I experienced. I loved God. I read his word. I went by the light of God. I had the spirit. I was filled with the oil of God. But I didn't even realize because of this, now I could walk out there. And when I didn't know what to say, I didn't even say anything. Just my very presence was manifestly declaring to somebody that I was a child of God. It's when you get into this place. Oh, I'm going to read some more. I'm going to get you there. Y'all looking at me like, what they say? A calf looking at a new goat. Uh, gate I don't know what that means but some old saying like huh it goes on down but um, if the ministration of death let me read this in the over here in my Bible because I'm gonna skip down this chapter he said if the ministration of death written engraved in stones was glorious so the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory that was on his countenance and that was a glory that was going to be done away with. How much more shall the manifestation of the Spirit be rather glorious? For if that which was done away with was glorious, which is a law, how much more that which we have now be glorious? But not as Moses who had to put a veil over his face that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look upon him, something that was going to be abolished. But even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, if they turn back to the Lord, the veil will be taken away. For this veil was done away with was by Christ. Now the Lord is a law, it's spirit, and that spirit that shines on them is the spirit of the Lord. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. For now we all, with open face, no veil, the veil's taken away, beholding as our face in a, a glass or a mirror, the glory of God are changed from its same image from glory to glory, even by the Spirit of the Lord. What did I just say? I said a lot, <laughs> or he said a lot. He said, when you look at Moses' law, if that law that come down and said, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not lie, and all the, or bear false witness, he said, if that was so glorious that, the people, that Moses had to cover his face, and that was just going to be, because that was even a death sentence on people. He said, if that is that way, how much more is now what's come? This mercy, this grace message, be so glorious. He said, how did you get it? First of all, you have to remove the veil. 
and I know this might be a little deep for some of you, but, but just hang with me. Between this and this was what? A big old thick veil. It was a curtain that was very thick. It was fabulous. It was hung from the ceiling. And when Jesus was, when he died, he said, it's finished. What happened? This veil from the top to the bottom, not from the bottom like a man could rip it. God ripped this huge thick veil from top to bottom. He ripped it, literally. They went in the temple. Oh, my gosh, who ripped up the veil? They probably got some seamstress in there and just sewed it back up. Because they was Jews, they wanted to just keep having church as usual. But he'd just get a big sign and said, uh-uh, there's no more veil. Now, it's no longer just a priest could go in here once a year, the glory of God. Now, whosoever will could come in there. Because he, now he said, I'm going to make you priest unto me, every one of you. And now everybody... Everybody, everybody has access to the power and the glory of God. You can go beyond the veil. You can go beyond what happens in your flesh. This, is, this, this veil represents the flesh. Jesus' flesh died. Whoop, it's over. But the only way you go through here is to do away with your flesh, which is your brain. It's your mind. It's your thinking. That's when you say, not my will, but your will be done. I don't want to figure this out in my head. I give this to you. I can literally die right here and go into his presence in his mind I will be right in the presence of God and when I leave this place I will be just like the apostles it said they perceived they were ignorant unlearned men but they also perceived that they had been with Jesus why did they know they had been with Jesus because when they come out of that presence there was a glory on them do y'all know that every time in this service we know today you've been in his presence that when you leave this house today, that you're just like Moses coming down from the mountain. There is a glory on you. There is a glory that people can, they don't even know why. They don't even know why. Because you have now gone beyond the veil. You are now with an unveiled face. You took off your flesh. Oh, this is so, I wish I could say like I really, oh, I know in my spirit. Lord, help me to get this across to them. This is so powerful, Lord. I know you gave it to me this morning. Just let us see who we are. That we can have unveiled faces. He said every time they looked in the law of Moses, he said to this day, every time you look at the law, you know what the law is? What I do right, what I do wrong. You screwed up right there. You messed up again. Every time you look at yourself in the flesh, a veil comes over you, and you can't see the glory of God in you. All you see is your face. All you see is your sin. All you see is your condemnation. All you see, you see the veil, the flesh. He said, every time people start preaching the law, and I've seen it, every time you start preaching law again to people, a veil comes over people's face, and they do some of the most ignorant things I've ever seen trying to be holy. Right now, the Muslims, they still believe, believe that Abraham is their father. That's why they're fighting over the same mount right now in Israel. They're fighting over it because they both claim. And you know what? They have such a veil over their face. They go back to the law. They go back past Mo before Moses. And you know what they do? They have their women wearing these barkas. They think they're being holy. Just a little peep eyes. Well, I didn't do that, but I did other things. I know right now I got called about a lady. Not called, but I got a Facebook message la late last night. They said, can you contact this girl? I said her family has, has, has won't even talk to her because now she's, she's not dressing the way they do and she don't go to the church with them. They are actually shunned their daughter. It's just like the Amish, the shunning. You ever watch those Amish shows? They shun you. Oh, people are shunning people all over. Because when the law is preached to you, there's a veil that comes over you, and you'll, it's all about, I've got to be holy, I've got to be holy. And let me tell you something. You can wear a barker from the head to the toe. It does not make you holy. You can never say a cuss word. You can never do anything wrong, and you're still not holy enough. All your righteousness is filthy rags before the Lord. The only way you're going to be righteous is to be able to put on the robe of righteous by faith and let his glory be your robe. And yes, we want to live good lives. Yes, I don't want to be like them and fall down and have a terrible life and thinking I stand because I'm relying on my, my own holiness. But let me tell you, every time the law is preached, a veil comes over people. And they cannot see the glory. All they see is flesh. And not only they see their own flesh, but they see your flesh. And if I'm convicted about something, I think everybody else should be. 
I know a preacher who was convicted one time. He went down the altar, and some woman had a, a dress on with a, a sleeveless dress, and she was raising her arms, praising the Lord, and he could see down into her, her, her bra area. And he was so convicted that he made a rule in his church that everybody had to wear long sleeves. Not just sleeves, but at least to your elbow. And most of them right around here. Why? He was convicted probably because of his own lust problem. He called it love. Oh, did I say that? He called it, I'm convicted, so everybody in my church needs to do this. That is the law. It's so, it'll cause you to do some crazy things trying to be holy. The law could never make you holy. And every time the law is preached, there's a veil upon your face. But he said, when you, with an unveiled face, will look into the mirror, Oh, right here. He said, you will look in that mirror, and you will see the reflection. As you look in that mirror, you see Christ. What happens, it's glory becomes your glory. Glory to glory. You will walk out of the presence of God. The only way you can become like God is you see him, you can be him. Oh, no man's ever seen God live. Oh, yes. But when I'm in the Spirit... He said, it has not re been revealed to people what God can do. Eye has not seen and ears not heard, but he reveals it by his spirit. And when you get in that spirit place with him, when you can cut your head off, get in that closet and work if you have to, and you go in and say, God, I cut my head off. I don't know how to do this. I need the glory of God to come out. You are my head. I have the right because I am the body. I have Christ as my head. I have it. You don't even know you have it. It's not what you do. It's who you are. And we live beneath it because we don't know we can do it. Lord, thank you right now, the glory of God. And when I walk out of this closet, I'm going to walk out of this bathroom stall. I'm going to walk out of this bedroom. I had to go hide in the bedroom for my kids for a while, my husband. But when I walk out, I don't have to say a word. The glory of God is going to be upon me, and he will change the situation. But I had to be able to go look in the mirror, the perfect law of liberty. Oh, there it is. I ain't even got to that scripture. The perfect, mm, I've got to get to that one. He said, when you, with an open face, no veil, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. I just read this. Where the Lord is that Spirit that reflects, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with an open face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of God, we are changed, we're transformed from that same image into his image from glory to glory by the Spirit. It's a transformation that you cannot do for yourself. The Spirit does it for you, he said. Where did I find, see that? That's number two, I know, right here. But if you be doers of the word, this is James 1, 22, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Don't deceive yourself. The devil can lie, but you have to deceive yourself. You have to receive it. If you be doers of the word. Die here die here about daily. Paul said, I die daily. He didn't have to go back here and be saved daily. No, he was already saved. This was the death. Not my will, but thy will be done. If you be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if any man be a hearer of the word, not a doer, he's like a man beholding his natural face in a mirror, a glass. For he beholdeth himself and goes away. And straightforward he forgets what kind of man he is. But whoever looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues therein, not being a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man will be blessed in his deed. What is the perfect law of liberty? It's what we live under today, and it is perfect. Perfect means complete, entire, lacking nothing. If you will look into this law of liberty, I just read where the, where the Lord is, the Spirit, there's liberty. If you look and always just judging yourself by your flesh, you're going to be in trouble. The law of the Old Testament lived by the law of sin and death. Law means the principle. It was the ruling principle of the day. Law, the Bible called it the law of sin and death. That means you sin, you die. That's what the law of sin and death was. That's what Moses' law was. You'd be stoned to death. This happened. This is the law of sin. You're worthy of death. Everybody would have died if Moses hadn't rolled their sins back by doing sacrifices every year, or the priest. That was the old law. 
for that law he said has been done away with. Now we have the perfect law of liberty. It's the ruling principle. And when you look at that law, when you behold that law, that's the mirror. See, we used to look in the law of do's and don'ts, the law of the word of the Old Testament, the fleshly things that you did. You'll always come up short. You'll walk away and you'll want to put a bushel over your head. You'll walk away and you'll want to crawl under a bed because none of us are perfect. If that's what I'm looking at in the Word, if that's what I'm beholding in my face, that part of the Word. That's what you said. Well, you look in the Word and it'll line you up. Don't be like a forgetful here, just do it and go around. I used to say, you know, it'd be like a person looking in the mirror and find out they have broccoli in their teeth and then walking off and forgetting about it and still smiling. Everybody's smiling back. They don't know why they're smiling back. It's because they've seen it, but they didn't do anything about it. A lot of people come to church, they see their problems, but they don't know nothing about it. Oh, yeah, I know I need to be a better husband. I know I need to be a better wife. I know. I, and they go on, they forget what man or man, they keep doing it, and then they just keep doing it and keep doing it until there's a crisis, and then they call me. Fix me. Fix my kid. They looked in the law. They'd seen it. They didn't do it. He said, don't be like that. But this is not what he's saying. He said, that's not the law. We're not supposed to be looking at the law of sin and death. We're not looking at what we do in the flesh. I'm supposed to be looking at what I do in the spirit. Because when I look in the perfect law of liberty, I'm free of sin. I'm free of sin. I don't care if I have sin. Yes, I want to repent, change my mind, change my ways. But the truth is I've already been set free by the blood of Christ because I came through the door and the first thing was a big old bloody mess of blood right here. And this was the body of Jesus. So I did not have to die. He's already died and he's already been buried. He was washed clean and he rose again. Now I'm in Christ because I'm in Christ. I'm like the little train. There's a, lot, a train. It's like has that my husband, I'd like trains because he's an engineer. But. Okay, you have a train. Here's the here's the. Uh, I'm not gonna try to drive a train, but here there's all these little cars, right? So wherever he goes, wherever Gary's driving, they all go with him. He goes up a hill, they go up a hill. That's just like Jesus. When I connected to him, when he was buried, when he was crucified, I was crucified. The Bible said I've been crucified with Christ, yet I live. Oh, then when he went down in that river Jordan and he was baptized of water, representing the death that he was going to do, when he went through that water, I went through that water. When he went through that grave, I went through that grave. When he come through here and he was alive, I am following him. Whoop, 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 right here. All I got to do is get connected to the Spirit. He said, He is. That is Him. This is done by the Spirit. It's not done by you. Quit trying to make yourself be holy. Quit trying to make yourself be spiritual. Just do what He said. Go look at Christ. You get in the face of Christ, you'll come out. You'll have so much glory. People, they won't see you. They won't see your mess ups. They won't see your flesh. They'll sit beyond it. Somebody this last week told me about a situation. And they acted terrible at their place of business. But you know what happened? Because they went back, even though they acted terrible and they made a bad mistake. They sure wasn't being a very good spoken word right here. But the truth is because they went back and they was able to go and say, I didn't do that right. And I, that was not a good representation of who I am. You know what? That person, the head person, come back and said, I see Jesus. I see you being Jesus in this place. In spite of their mess ups, in spite of all their flesh, when you get in the perfect law of liberty and you walk in the glory of God, people will not be focused on what you do and don't do. They'll just be focused on who you are. Because when you get with God, you're going to love. Because God is love. You cannot come out of that place without being filled with love. It's not something you do. It's something you are. You are now, God is the head. And I'm not thinking with the fleshly veil. I'm not seeing the fleshly veil. I'm not seeing your flesh. I'm not even seeing my flesh. As long as I see mine, I'm going to see yours. Some of y'all need to get into perfect law of liberty and start looking at what the Spirit's doing for you and quit trying to do it all yourself because you know what you're going to do? You're going to be just like those Israelites. You're going to be going in a circle in the wilderness. Wilderness was not a bad place. It was, this is not a bad place. You can stay here. You can stay here a long time. It's good. You can have church till you die. It's wonderful. Up here, they had manna. They had a light by night and a cloud by day. Got their shoes never wore out. Their I would have hated that. I don't want no shoes. They, they had, their shoes never wore out. Their clothes never wore out. God was a provider. He led them. 
They had a good leader. They had a tabernacle. They could go in and get their sins remitted. They had this. But you know what? That was not where they wanted to stay. They didn't come out of this just to stay here. You did not get saved just to have church the rest of your life. You did not come this far just to try to, you and Jesus, have our own thing going. That's good. I do have Jesus. But I like it when I go beyond who Pam is. I don't want anything to do with it. This is what he can do what I cannot do. Does that make sense? This is when you become the living word. This is what you do. This is what you are. And you only get to that place when you cut the veil, when you go through the veil of the flesh, when it's ripped apart and you have to lay your head down. And oh, what a joy it is. Oh, what a joy it is. Paul said, I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness. I was with you in fear. I was with you in trembling. Paul? Oh, let me read. Does that sound like some of y'all? Paul. Apostle Paul. I was with you in fear, weakness, and much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but it was a demonstration of the spirit and power. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, not the wisdom of this world nor the princes of this world, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the, glo- before the world was made unto our glory. I just quoted it a while ago. It's written, eyes not seen, ears not heard, neither is it entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. But God revealed them to us how? By his spirit. Romans 8 18, for I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation, the disclosure, the appearing, the revelation of the sons of God. Everybody around you is yearning and groaning. You don't have to look for them. They will come to you. The reason why people come to you because you're being a light in that place. Because the whole world is groaning and looking for this to happen. They want the manifestation of the Spirit of God through you. They're looking for it. They want God to see. They want to see it. They've seen religion. They've heard the messages. They've seen all this. But they're still learning, yearning for what's fixed to happen, what's happening right now. Josh, those men, those firefighters, the dangerous situations, the time you go, the heartbreaks you see, the men around you and the women around you are longing to see that. That's all they're looking for. They're looking. They're not just looking for your works. They want to see God in you. The hope of glory means the hope of something being manifest. There's diversities of gift. First Corinthians, but the same Spirit. There are different administrations, but the same Lord. There's diversities of operations. There's three right there: gifts, administrations, and operations. But the same God works in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. That word right there with all means to contribute, to bear together. For as a body we are one with many members. God has set every one of the members in the body as it has pleased him. He's given every one of y'all gifts to benefit us all. It means to all to bear this thing together. You're not going to do it alone. You're going to do it because you do what I said well ago. You find the place where you connect. And when you're connected, the more we're connected, the more glory they see. It's like the piece of the puzzle. You put more pieces you put together, the clearer the picture becomes. You feel like you're connected today? When you get connected, the manifestation of the Spirit will be given to you to profit with all, to contribute your part, to bear together Because you are a city that sit on a hill that cannot be hid. John said last week at prayer meeting, he says you cannot be hid. Does men light a candle? Do they buy a candle and put it under a bushel? God will never put a bushel over you. You are a city that cannot be hid. You're trying to hide it. But the truth is you are a city. You are a light. You're trying to cover yourself. God said, I didn't cover you. I've already covered you with my blood. Quit trying to cover up. 
He set you on a candlestick. He set you in the body where it pleased him. Quit trying to hide under a bed. You cannot be hid. Can a candle, can a city hide its light? He said, you're a city, cannot be hid. What are you trying to hide behind? He said, I didn't hide you behind this. I bought you with a price. I put you where you are. Just be who you are and get rid of all that stuff you're hiding behind. And if you need somebody personal to get to, a brother, brother, or sister, and James has said, go and confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that you'll be healed. That means you'll be completely whole, the perfect law of liberty. Somebody needs to quit blaming God's put you on a shelf. God has not put you anywhere but on a candlestick. Oh, he might be trimming your wick a little bit. That could be painful. He might be filling you up with oil a little bit because you've been a little dry. You Sometimes we just got to get parked somewhere and get filled up. But he has not set you on a, uh, somewhere and hid you. He has not counted you out. Don't you believe that lie? He that begun a good work in you, as the song said, will finish it. He's your first and the last. Let's get some music. Father, today I thank you for your word. I thank you today, Lord, that you said we're a peculiar people, a special treasure to show forth the praises of him who's called us out of darkness into your marvelous light. Help your people see that they are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a nation, a peculiar special treasure to shine forth before men that they may see our good works and glorify our Father which is in heaven. I pray today that the veil of the law has been removed from people today, that they was without shame, without unveiled fa- with unveiled faces, they'll come right into your presence today not being afraid to face you. Hold our faces up today and say, shine on me. Shine on me, Father. Let your glory be reflected through who I am inside. I won't have to worry about the outside. If I can just get with you, they'll know I've been with Jesus. Your glory will shine like the stars. Hallelujah.